Hey everybody, hope you're doing well. Uh, you can see the sun there setting behind me, which is very beautiful. Uh, I wanted to look at another trader who's been sort of recommended by a lot of the people uh, commenting on my videos. It's this guy here, slow and steady, Patrick Pelton. Now this guy hasn't got a lot of uh, history. Well, we'll go through it, but he hasn't got a lot of history. He's a fairly new guy, um, but a lot of people have started copying him and we'll kind of have a look at why, you know, and what you all think about that. So just to go in, so uh, he's from the Netherlands, slow and steady, slow and steady, Patrick Pelton. And here he's on champion level popular investor. So at the moment, because I believe the popular investor system's about to change, I'm not sure if that's true, but there we go. Uh, there, at the moment it's blue, yellow, blue, which is cadet, yellow, which is rising star, then champion, which is red, then elite, which is green. So he's on the third one. He's on the level before the elite level. You can see that set of videos, which I'll probably have to redo up there. Um, but there we are, he's doing well, slow and steady. Go over here, Patrick Pelton, risk score of four, which is, there we are. Uh, Netherlands strategy type, um, long-term active ETF investor, playing it safer by always hedging risk. Um, so he's not, he's saying obviously it's not always safe, it can't be safe completely, that's why he's put safe R, he's put the R in there. So what's an ETF, first of all? Uh, an ETF is an exchange traded fund, it's one of the types of assets that we can trade on eToro um, and in many different places. So it's a fund which is put together by a group of people, some clever people somewhere go alright, we're going to make a fund. This is what we want in our fund. And it gets so popular, this fund. People think it's of such value that it's actually, it becomes traded as a fund on exchanges. You can buy and sell this, and many people are interested in that fund. Now, an ETF is, it works basically a bit like a basket of goods. I keep, I've said this before, but if you buy an equity, say you buy Apple stock, or you buy Google, or you buy uh, even a commodity, you buy gold, or you buy oil, you know, you're buying a sort of single asset. So an ETF, what it does is it tries to get often exposure to a particular sector, okay? So let's say there's an oil ETF. It might have in this basket, which is the fund, it might have some uh, different oil companies, some people who drill for oil, some people who do the, the imaging, which finds out where you should drill for oil, maybe some companies who do all the logistics for oil companies. The entire sector of oil industry might be represented by lots of different assets within this uh, ETF. So banking might have many different banks in it. Uh, I don't know, other things to do with banking, all in one banking ETF, okay? Um, some of them also, uh, uh, they sort of track the performance of different indices like the uh, S&P 500 or the NASDAQ 100 or whatever. So ETFs can do a, a range of things. And they're seeing as being sort of diversified. Even within it, you're not buying a single asset, you're buying a basket with many different assets. So let's say a couple of them don't do so well, the others might do well. It's it's sort of there's some risk management within it, you know. You're betting that the whole thing, on all, it, overall, it's if you're buying, overall you're betting that the value of that sector is going to go up, okay. that's ETFs give you exposure to a sector or a, a broader thing than just one asset usually. So he's a long-term active ETF investor, playing it safe, always hedging risk. Hedging risk, obviously, um, uh, if this goes up, this one will go down. So if you're buying this and you think this one might fall down, then you can buy another asset which you know that if this one goes down, that one will go up. And in that way, it sort of gives you some insurance in your trades. Okay, so strategy description. I monitor markets and base my risk appetite on macroeconomic and political developments. Macroeconomic, the big forces which drive uh, economics in the world. Not like the sort of small ones within countries or within regions or within, but the major global forces which could shape how things uh, are valued. Um, this determines my risk versus hedge balance. So risk versus hedge is how much is he betting, is he saying that, all right, when you risk, when you hedge a portfolio, often a long short portfolio, like say Harshmith does, he'll be buying some things and selling others. Or he'll be buying this company and he'll be buying another asset, which if this company goes down, that one will go up. Or right? he's hedging everything. Sometimes though, they think that the market's going to move in a particular direction. They're pretty sure of it, more sure of it than normal. So they go out on a limb and they put less hedging on a certain asset. So they'll buy gold and they won't hedge it as much because they're really fairly sure, you know, that that one's going to go up. Now, the more sure they are that something's going to go in a particular way, the more they'll, they'll take some risk and they won't hedge something, a trade, as much. The more they're unsure, the hedging will come in so that in case everything goes wrong, we're going to be okay. So 
that determines his risk versus hedge balance. And this is going to be a bit long, isn't it? But I'm trying to explain the little I understand of these things. Not a financial advisor, but there we go. Subsequent and corresponding risk and hedge ETF trades are based on asset correlation and technical indicators. Asset correlation means that you get two assets which are tied together. Okay. In some way, if this one moves, that one normally moves. And if this one goes up, that one normally goes down. If this one goes up, that one normally goes down. Or maybe if this goes up, they all go up. Sometimes they're inversely correlated, means they go in different directions. Sometimes they're correlated, means they move in the same price. For instance, re recently we've seen a lot of people talking about how Bitcoin and the stock market seem to now be correlated. You know, like one moves up, the other one moves up. And they're different assets, but they seem to be moving kind of in, in lockstep. So... Uh, I keep eToro fees to a minimum so that I maximize profits. Always good. Um, investment period, he's saying it's long term, more than six months. His education is a master's in, is that business administration? I think, I'm not management. Um, professional experience, he's a full-time technology consultant, investing in his own time since 2012, which is a long time, it's like eight years. On He's been on eToro since April 2019. This is not a long time, it's like last year. Uh, April, May, a year and a month, what is that? Uh, minimum copy amount. Whilst you can copy me starting from 250, nice. So you can copy him with 250. He recommends that you copy him with $1,000 in order to capture dividend gains. So he's going after dividends. Now, one thing from ETFs uh, ETFs on eToro, you can actually get the dividends if it's an ETF which has lots of different companies in. And some of those companies are reporting giving dividends. You can get those dividends even though they're part of an ETF, as far as I understand. I think that's what he's talking about here. In order to capture dividend gains, I always recommend to copy open trades. Mantra, slow and steady investing wins the race. Uh, next, read my pinned post for more information, which we will. And his personal notes, he loves pizza, snowboarding, and scuba diving. Good range of activities there for slow and steady, Patrick. So here's his pinned post over here, which is a bit long. You can read this, you can go through and have a look at it. I've had a look at it. Uh, he's saying his portfolio seeks to provide stable and steady long-term returns with ETF-only exposure. So he's sticking to ETFs. He's not going to go out on a limb and just start buying a bit of Bitcoin and a bit of gold and individual assets or Tesla or Apple or shorting the Nasdaq by itself or whatever. He's, he's ETFs, okay? Always ETFs with him. The portfolio is easy to understand and will not give you sleepless nights. So he's trying to promote this as a safe thing. Or eToro risk score of less than three. Now, obviously, he's at four there, but I saw somewhere else that he was talking about getting it back under three. Um, investors should comp consider copy this strategy if they look for some core exposure, stability, and returns in the wider portfolio, which may or may not already include stocks of individual companies. All right. Uh, the strategy aims to outperform its benchmark. Now, its benchmark is what he's measuring it against. Okay, So it's Jack Bogle, who's a very famous investor. Jack Bogle's passive portfolio of SPY, which I believe is an um, uh, ETF which tracks the S&P 500, and TLT, which I believe is an ETF which tracks the 20-plus uh, year US Treasuries bonds. 60 to 40 percent split on them, so it's 60 percent SP 500, 40 percent treasuries. That's what this other guy, Jack Bogle, has. He wants to outperform that. This benchmark portfolio has had a compound annual growth rate of nine percent since 2002, which is quite amazing. And he wants to outperform that. That's his benchmark, that's what he's measuring himself against. Okay, so high level strategy is to monitor market, market risk and base our risk appetite on macroeconomic. We've read this political developments, um, we've read that one. The portfolio is balanced at any given point in time, and new copiers should always copy open trades. So what he's saying there is that when you look at his portfolio, he's kind of set it all up in terms of his hedging, in terms of how he's going to manage his risk. So if he owns this company, he's got another one, or this ETF, he's got another ETF where if this one loses value, that one will go up. So his portfolio is always like looking at a snapshot of an established system. So if you copy open, I had this with Harshmith, you know, because Harshmith does the same thing. He has a hedged long short portfolio. So if you uh, don't copy open trades, maybe he opens a new trade and he'll buy one thing. And that new one is now not hedged properly because his portfolio is working as an overall thing, which he says he's rebalancing monthly. Um, so to just buy in and he starts populating it as he opens new trades, they may be unhedged and it will defeat the purpose of his system, which is an overall thing hope that makes sense. So, um, while you can start from, uh, should always copy open trades, while you can copy you starting from 250, same thing, 1,000 uh, to capture gains from our dividend positions. To learn more about copy trading, and there's more stuff about copy trading, let's see what that asterisk is here. 
Uh, eToro pays dividends for the schedule. All right, so he's saying how you can actually look and find your dividends. Very useful information there in the account statement. He talks about that. Have a look and have a read. Um, so, uh, main reasons to invest in ETFs are no individual stock risk because it's poor, it's diversified. There's many different things in one basket. Mutually exclusive if needed. Uh, we can invest in assets and bond ETFs, technology, healthcare, so that they focus on different sectors and they don't overlap, which is useful. No sector risk. There is an ETF for almost every sector you can imagine. If we do not like a cer certain sector, like banking or oil or whatever, we can just avoid the corresponding ETFs. So uh, he's picking and choosing and watching is what he's saying. Low costs. ETFs and eToro come with zero fees if unleveraged. And I, I'm assuming he's not using leverage. Management fees are typically low as well. Diversification, we know that. Efficiency, it's kind of related to above. If managed well, ETFs, he provide, he think they provide the best risk return ratio, in his opinion. Um, so low maintenance, he usually rebalances and reallocates his portfolio once a month and that's enough. Okay, so once a month he's going to go, what's happening? How's it looking? Boom, rebalance. Buy this one, buy this one, all rest. So there we go. Um, uh, before copying the strategy, you, you, you should consider the inherent possible drawdown. The max drawdown is the greatest loss a strategy can suffer suffered during a specific period, daily, weekly, all time. It's something I look at in all of my things. What's the max drawdown? It's how I set my copy stop loss um, in the last time. You can view the drawdown of slow and steady here. It's a stats page. For example, the worst week this strategy had in the last 12 months resulted in a loss of two, minus 2.69%, after which the strategy covered. Unfortunately, no strategy goes up in a linear fashion. All right, so uh, there we are. There's him. He's ETF investor. He keeps talking about risk management, keeps talking about being how ETFs are diversified, and that's why he's into them. Uh, talks about rebalancing monthly. Uh, keeps sort of trying to say you're not going to get a headache from this. Don't worry. This is something. Promoting it as a sort of a safe strategy. Let's look at his stats and see what's happening. So, uh, 2019 and 2020, that's all we can see is one year and one month, really. One year and two months, but actually one year and one month because it's a zero on the beginning. So he made 7.39% last year, 3.68% so far this year. It's very little data. But what we can see is yeah, minus 2.31 is the, the biggest monthly loss there. And the rest of them, 4.41 is a very acceptable, respectable gain. 0 0.90, 0 0.11, 0 0.04, 0 0.99, 1%, 0.68, 2.30. .0. And this year so far, 1.04, 0 0.66, 0 0.57, 1.29 in April, and so far 0 0.08 in May. So he's, you know, uh, he's looking at this in terms of, he's not showing huge rewards. This is not like, you're going to make 27% in this month and 13% in that month. I don't also see corresponding massive drawdowns, though. It's not like it's very volatile, up and down, up and down. Now, that's all right. People look for, you know, how much do they want in return. Normally, they'll take less return as long as the risk's slow. If your risk is huge and you're only getting small returns, people will go, well, no. People are looking for, if there's lower returns, they want to see much lower risks. So what's he got? Um, average three, max three, average two, max three, average one. So we can see already, like, this is a lower risk profile than the previous person, than Mr. G, for instance, who had much bigger gains, but a slightly only slightly higher risk profile, actually. Max drawdown, minus 1.47% daily, uh, minus 2.69% weekly, and minus 3.56% yearly. So in the and this yearly, by the way, it's the last 12 months, and people said that in the last video, you know, how come Mr. G had a minus 50% or something one of the years, yet his max drawdown only showed 10.5% or whatever. This shows the last 12 months. It would be useful if we could see more, but we can't, so there we are. Um, not at a glance, anyhow, there we are. So um, here we are, minus 3.56, so it is actually a low ish, really, risk profile. And he said he tries to keep it at three, and he has done, really. Average three, max four, and there he's at average four, max four. And I read somewhere that he was trying to get that back under, uh, back down to three again. That's what he's doing at the moment. But there we are, it's a lower risk profile, lower rewards. Now, this is rewarded. Look at his copiers over here 2,786 copiers, plus 537 copiers in the last seven days. Now, what's he done so far this month? In May, 0.08% so far. All right, so, and it's now May the 6th, all right? So that's in the last seven days. Now, somehow, he's got plus 537 copiers whilst he's only making 0.08%. Why? Because I think at the moment, markets are very volatile. No one knows what's going on. Everyone's worried. There's a lot of fear, obviously, in the world because of what's going on. People aren't sure what to do. So this looks safe. And if it looks safe, boom, you start getting copiers. Look at the rise there. Look at that. So a lot of people are going for this. Would you? Would I? Not sure. I mean, very little 
to go on so far, but I like the sound of what he's saying. I don't know if you do yet, but it makes sense. 316 trades, 100% ETFs, actually 100.03%. It's possible. 100% ETFs, average profit is 4.29, average loss is minus 2.59. So his average profit is bigger than his average loss, and he's mostly 58.54% profitable, which means he's going to be making money. So uh, most treated thing, uh, TLT, which is, look, the 20-plus year treasury bond from ICOs, Gold ETF, SPDR Gold, it's the gold ETF, I think that's, I'm not sure if that's the same one I've got, no, I've got the other one, I think. IEF, uh, it was iShares Barclays 7 to 10 year treasury bond, See how specific they can get. These are the things he's been trading mostly. That one, 5% profit, 0.88% loss, 4.57 profit, minus 1.45 loss. So his profit, his average profit is bigger than his average loss on all of them, and he's profitable, this one, no, but look, it's three times the size, the average profit. So he will still be profitable, even though that's under 50%. So there we are. He's doing well there. 6.08 trades per week. Uh, one month average holding time. Three, uh, he's been active since the 3rd of the 7th, 2019. Um, and 66.67% profitable weeks. There he goes. There's his stats. For me, what I'm seeing there is is basically what he's saying. He's trying to create stability there's a stable thing there so you know olivia danville is also looking for stability constant green months he has one red month olivia's got no red months so far but there's a big market uh it seems for people who want stability and low risk and just don't lose my money preservation of capital for god's sake i'm going to put my money with you i can't afford to risk this like please just don't lose my money make money okay i don't mind if you don't make a lot of money just don't lose my money that seems to be what he's doing here. And using an ETF, which is an appropriate asset, to try and um, diversify and create as low a risk as possible, as far as I understand. Risk scores are low. It's looking good, and a lot of other people seem to be believing him. Uh, let's look at his portfolio at the moment. Now, let's look at his chart first. Uh, so his chart, whoop, no, hold on, I'm going to go back to the portfolio and go back to chart, because I hate it when it starts jumping around like that. If we copied him again, simulated 10,000 copy. If we copied him with 10,000 a year ago, we'd now 11, have $11,214, okay? Quite amazing. Do you see major drawdowns? I don't. That, what's that? 10,000 all the way down here to 9,690, 9,700. Very small drawdowns, and he's been going up and then going sort of sideways, down a little, down, up, up, down a little. There's not huge spikes anywhere. That is from 10,500 down to 10.3, 10,300. I mean, this is a very small, the peaks and troughs are very low on this. This one, 11,280, all the way down to 10,810. So that's a $400 drop, as far as I can see. Now, it looks obviously more, because I'm used to looking at other people's charts. These are still small drawdowns. But generally, if you had to draw a line, it's it's pretty it's pretty good up. Let's compare them to someone else. Let's compare them to Olivia. Um, Olivia Danville. Olivia Danville, one of the most copied people. Um, zero uh, red months. Uh, loads of copiers. So, and now look, it's changed the value, by the way. When you do this, when you compare them, it changes the value over to uh, percentages, uh, which you would have made. Your percentage of profit over the last 12 months, which is really useful, and I didn't actually see that yesterday. So, over here in green is Olivia, who would have made you 8.2% last over the last 12 months. And over here in blue is slow and steady, who would have made 12.1% in the last 12 months. As we can see here, so we see... Um, we don't in in Olivia. He's had a couple of times with these very sharp drawdowns where he's managed to bring it back and he's made money. And look, boom, both times back up and boom back up. But even that level of drawdown, we don't actually see in slow and steady. It's a bit more wavering and all over the place, but generally not those huge sharp drawdowns. Um, so he's done well and he's sort of on par so far. Obviously, uh, Olivia has much more data. He has sort of a few years going back, all green, but so far he's doing well. Let's compare him then to someone who's higher risk. So let's compare Harsh Smith, who's higher risk. He's more volatile, more volatility. Uh, let's compare him to Harsh Smith. Uh, so Harsh Smith was actually down and he was below him. So slow and steady is slow and steady. You see him, the blue line going up, whereas Harshmith is much more volatile, down, down, and then boom, when he wins, he's, he's high above. And he's at 26.9% Harshmith for the last 12 months. But you can see the difference in terms of swinging about and volatility, and whether that's something you want or something you can handle. You know what I mean? Let's look at, um, who else can we look at? The person we did yesterday, Mr. G. Let's have a look at Mr. G, who we looked at yesterday. So Mr. G would be in blue, 
just bam, the volatility is much bigger. Bam, huge spikes upwards. Now the thing about volatility is that volatility can spike upwards or it can spike downwards. Now with Mr. G here, we've seen spikes upwards. You know, especially that's when all the people were, were telling me to copy him. It was in March, huge spike upwards. I don't know if it was 17 or 27%. But volatility can go both ways. Now I don't know if that's gonna happen with Mr. G. I don't know what's gonna happen. But he's into the volatility and he's winning at the moment. Whereas down here, you can see sort of Olivia Danville, and, and slow and steady, obviously much slower and steady, a much lower volatility. It depends what you're after. Do you know what I mean? What are you after? So like 63.71% in the last 12 months for Mr. G. 26.93% for Harshmith. Let's have a look at J. Uh, what would J have done? So J Nemesis, there he is, boom. So J again, more volatile, the purple line. Down, up, boom, boom. And he's up at 31.28% for the last 12 months. So Mr. G's sort of winning over the last 12 months out of all of them. Mostly this spike here in, in, in March. But there we are. You can see the difference in volatility. Um, but not many drawdowns. If I get rid of these ones, just click the right button. I'll get rid of them again. Uh, you can see the, the, the difference in, in volatility. He's going for a low volatility thing. Slow and steady. The name does seem appropriate, at least so far. Uh, let's see what he's trading. Um, I'm going to go here, over to his portfolio. So, uh, TLT, that's a 20-year treasury bond, so you can have a look at what they are. Go on, investopedia.com, babypips.com, uh, they're both free, you can learn tons of stuff about what treasuries are, what ETFs are, better explanations than I'm giving, all of these things you can look up. And of course, like IEF, you can just go and look, IEF, you type it in, and you can find out here, iShares Barclays, 7-10-year to 10 year treasury bond, and you can read more about it there. Uh, and uh, there we go. So you can find out more. And you can look these up. Just go to Google and type it in. You'll find as much information as you want about who created each ETF and what they do. Uh, so gold, he's buying. Now, with hedging, obviously, say Harshmith, uh, you get like um, hedging in terms of uh, buying and selling. He's got a long, short portfolio. So he might be long this asset and short this asset. And that's how he's creating his hedge. So he's buying some and selling others, you know, in case so that they move in opposite directions and they create that hedge. He's buying everything. How can you have a hedged portfolio if you're just buying? So they can be inversely correlated. Okay, so uh, for instance, gold and uh, QQQ. Now QQQ, as far as I know, is the NASDAQ, NASDAQ 100. Let me just look that up. I think it, it uh, power shares. The ETF consists of the same companies, including the NASDAQ 100 index. All right, so uh, these are going to be, a lot of them, they're the hundreds of the largest non-financial companies in the US. What do you think is going to be in there? Tesla. Google, Apple, uh, Netflix, Amazon, you know, huge tech stocks, that, the big powerful uh, US ones. Now, let's say uh, this one, he, which he's buying, fails, all right? Let's say that fails. What's going to happen? So as let's say all those equities are going down and the, the Nasdaq 100 is going through the floor. All the investors start panicking, pull their money out, and they want to move it somewhere safe. Where are they going to move it safe? At? Where's safe? Traditionally, a safe haven might be gold. You see? So if this one goes down, this one will go up. He's buying both. He's buying both and they're inversely correlated, which means that he's hedged. You see? You can be buying, only buying, and still be hedged by inversely correlated assets. Slow and steady, or anyone, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding is that that's actually what he's doing, inversely correlated assets. And he'll weight them in certain ways. Because you might say, well, if he's buying both and they're inversely correlated, isn't he going to not make any money? He balances the ratio of that. He balances the ratio in terms of which way he thinks it's going to go, but he also keeps some insurance. That's what he was saying about more or less risk versus hedge earlier. If he becomes really sure that the, the QQQ is just going to keep going up, he's not that worried about it tanking, he might lower his exposure to the GLD ETF, you see, so that he can let those profits run and he won't be eating into those profits with too much from the GLD going down. And then if he comes, becomes really unsure, he doesn't know what's going to happen, he might equal them so that it's more or less hedged at the moment. Do you, do you know what I mean? So, there we are. That's what he's buying. If we look at the history, um, it's all buys. Look, it's all buys. Uh, I'll go to 60 days, three, month, uh, three months, 90 days. It's all buys. Look, and first of the fourth to the first of the fifth. 31st of the third to the first of the fifth. That one's, uh, what, one month, one month. Um, yep, so he's holding things for about a month. He does seem to be rebalancing. I don't know if he holds other things longer. We could look, you could go through it. But he is doing that rebalancing. 9th of the 4th to the 1st of the 5th. 16th of the 4th to the 1st of the 5th. Yeah, he is rebalancing there. 
and we saw, you know, in his, his statistics how much he's letting the, the losers go and uh, the losing trades run and not very much. He's cutting stuff off. He's setting his stop losses or, or cutting them off manually. He's controlling his risk, really. Uh, that's what he's doing. Uh, that one is inversely correlated. So the SQQQ gives you exposure. If you buy it, it's an inverse correlation against the um, NASDAQ, I believe. SQQQ. Very clever. There's, there's ETFs which do all sorts of stuff. ProShares Ultra Short ProQQ is an exchange traded fund. Uh, blah, 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 blah. The ProShares Ultra Short Pro seeks investment results of three times the inverse exposure of the daily performance of the NASDAQ 100. So if the NASDAQ 100 moves down, this will move up three times as much. It's amazing what you can do with ETFs. So he is, that's his part of his hedging. Anyhow, I'll stop with that. So, um... That's him. That's him. Uh, what do you think? All right, I'm going to leave the poll up here. Um, would you copy him? So yes or no, or add him to a watch list uh, for later. I'm aware the sun's really going down. Now. So yes, no, add him to a watch list for later. And please do vote so that other people can see. And remember, you can't see the results of that poll until you vote. The second you press yes, no, or add to watch list, you'll suddenly then see what everyone else did. Um, so there we go. Um, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm worried about the lack of, I might replace, I might replace him for, um, Grepod is the truth. I might take that money that I've got in Grepod and replace him because Grepod's not been doing much with, with this guy slow and steady. Um, he's not high risk and he has, look, it's risky for me to do this because I haven't got lots of, um, I can't see lots of historical data. If I can't see year and a half, two years, I don't know. Is he going to have style drift? Which is style drift is where they set up their style. They say they're going to do this. And then suddenly they veer off and start doing something completely opposite and blow everything. I don't know. I don't think so, honestly. But I don't know. I think this man's professional from what he says in his feed. I mean, someone said to me, you know, don't believe anything they write in their bio. It could be made up. I, I, I take it with a bit of a pinch of salt, but I generally do seem to believe it. I might be an idiot, but I do. Um... But I, I think he's, he's said enough stuff which, to me, I've heard other investors talk about and seems to make sense in terms of what ETFs do as an asset class, how they're hedged, in terms of uh, correlation and inverse correlation and how that's part of a hedge, in terms of how he's benchmarking against someone uh, and he's uh, analyzed the, the, the growth rate of that. Um, there's many things he says which I think, yeah, all right, hold on a minute, that, that, they, they make sense. So at the moment, I'm sort of believing him. See what you think. Uh, Patrick Peltonen from the Netherlands, slow and steady. Um, I can't remember what else I've missed out. I'm sure there's some stuff I've missed out, but I don't know. I, I, I'm thinking about it. He's another one I'm thinking about. There's other people I'm looking at. People have asked if I copied Mr. G. Not yet. He hasn't replied yet. He hasn't replied to my, um, uh, my thing as far as I know. I'll have a check, but he didn't reply about what his max drawdown is. And that minus 50% year worries me still. But I might, but I, I'm not sure yet. So... Um, there we go. Hope you guys are well. What a beautiful kind of picture. I can see that in the thing. Uh, still got this off. Still took it off. No clinking. And I hope whatever you're doing, you're having a, a lovely evening. And take care, guys. See you. Bye. Any more suggestions for people to copy, put it, put it in there. And also, could you click the like button? Because I've noticed that people on YouTube now, uh, they all say click like and click subscribe. And I never do it. And apparently it really helps. Every time you click like, YouTube's algorithm will look at it and go, wow, people like this, and they'll promote my videos and it will be easier for more people to see them and for my channel to grow. So if you can click like, it would be super helpful to me. I'm going to start saying that. I'm sorry, YouTube thing now. There we go. But anyhow, be well. See you guys.